What does it take to scale geothermal in Europe and around the world? At the European Geothermal Congress in Zurich, one thing was very clear. Things are heating up fast in Europe, especially in heating and cooling, underground storage and minerals. And although a region might scale on their own, it's never as fast as when we collaborate together. In this episode, we'll hear from experts on why international collaboration is key and how that's shaping the future of our industry. This is GeoTV. What's heating up in Europe? Welcome back to GeoTV. I'm Gabriela Skog. And I'm Boel Steer. Europe is facing a critical moment, balancing energy security, climate goals and the need for innovation. In October 2025, more than 1200 people attended the European Geothermal Congress in Zürich. That's the largest event of its kind. Mm -hmm. And we asked participants one simple question. What do you think is most interesting in the geothermal scene right now? I would say is a 2.0 energy source in the globally and uh, both in Europe and uh, in Ukraine in, in particular, it's a very potential and sustainable source of energy potential supply. I guess the most interesting part is that uh, the energy demand, especially for eating, has been the one where fossil fuels were more used in the past historically. And that's probably the space where geothermal heat can be a real contributor to offset the utilization of fossil fuels moving forward. So Europe is a rock star of eating and cooling. Um, we've got so much to learn from them. It's really amazing to see what they're doing and what I really enjoy learning about and, and seeing um, being implemented is around the district eating system. But, you know, that uses energy from all sources. It's not just about geothermal. It's about being smart and using uh, way eat from other places that all feeds into the network and geothermal is one aspect but not the only one so it's really being more integrated and, and clever about the use of our energy um, that it fits the cities and the development we've seen in the last three years around underground thermal energy storage is absolutely mind-blowing and and it's going so fast and in countries like New Zealand, we haven't even considered it or looked at it. And, and there's so much we can learn. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here in Europe today because there's so much to learn. The, the booming of the uh, interest of uh, high tea giants in the uh, geothermal and also in uh, uh, developing with a e, uh, larger data center uh, could be another application of interest. So using a, a geothermal as base load power to decarbonize uh, data center uh, energy consumption. So traditionally, we always think of geothermal only for power generation. And uh, that's something that over the last years, excluding Turkey, I would say that uh, Europe has been pretty stable. <laughs> so not, 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 a, not a real uh, growth. Uh, heating and cooling is growing more and more. So I think in 2024, we got uh, 10 more district heating systems, uh, totaling around 400 district heating systems using geothermal. Uh, that's good, good news and it should grow and grow. Uh, heat pumps had uh, a bit of a, a setback in uh, 2024, 2025 uh, uh, looks a bit better. Uh, and uh, in minerals, for sure, we are at the cutting, cutting edge. Well, this is a really exciting time to be at EGC doing geothermal in Europe um, for, for a few different reasons. One, the European Commission will be coming out with the geothermal action plan early next year. Our hope is that this is an action plan that invests in innovation. And what I mean by that is invest in technologies like enhanced geothermal systems, closed loop geothermal systems, and those systems in super hot environments. The next thing I'm excited about is the build out of a next generation geothermal coalition, which we hope will bring momentum, continued momentum and impact for geothermal in the space. The third is the, is the testing facilities and the, and the fantastic projects that are happening throughout Europe. I'll name a, a couple. One is the Iceland Deep Drilling Project is planning its, its third round. We're very excited about that. Valorec, 
has some fantastic research and laboratory and testing facilities for, for casing and other equipment up to 500 degrees Celsius. That's really, really exciting. And also the Everloop project that's happening in Germany. I'm really looking forward to seeing results of that and any learnings that come out of that. Um, there's really energy in all directions for geothermal in Europe right now. So it's a, it's a really exciting time to be here. From new technologies to expanding heating networks, you can really hear the momentum in those answers, right? For sure. But if geothermal is going to grow in the speed that Europe really needs, collaboration is going to be the key that will unlock it all. Yes, so we sat down with three experts to dig deeper. To start with, we asked why is international collaboration so important for our industry? So we need to learn together about what's working, what's not working, and, and share that knowledge more widely so it can be implemented faster and new technology can also be developed at pace um, between, between the different countries. Collaboration is really important for the geothermal sector just generally, and I think it's actually in our DNA. I mean, I look at an example in New Zealand's history in geothermal, our army was in Italy at the end of the Second World War. And how we learned about geothermal in the first place was when we left, our soldiers saw the geothermal Ladarello. They returned to New Zealand and said, look, we have to go back to Italy. This technology could be used uh, in our country. And that's how geothermal began in New Zealand. That's such a fascinating story and also a great reminder about how international collaboration really shaped how geothermal came about mm. from the very beginning. For sure. But what about today? What uh, progress are we making and what are the barriers that still remain? We asked our experts for some concrete examples. So, I mean, I think of a really high profile one and that would be the Forge and Fervo example in the US right now. So publicly funded work through Forge, which had international collaboration. I mean, we're in Switzerland now and the Swiss team has had some inter interaction with that and we have had that from New Zealand too. So, you know, and that has come now through into giving geothermal a, a, a worldview which we wouldn't have expected right now, which is great. So that's probably an example where that's happened off the back of some people willing to take a risk, which is great. The other areas I'd say it's working really well is a number of those international risk mitigation funds and countries have been really valuable. So I think about the Caribbean now where you see, you know, the development in Dominica, which is occurring. That is a, of a long string of uh, funding, which has come from outside sources to get to that point where we are today. And I think about the GRMF in Africa, where not only the German funding, but New Zealand has contributed in there with, you know, technical support and upskilling, which is great. So those are some areas which we're doing, I think, really well in. So there are some cases where it works very well, and I uh, especially refer to industrial research. I think that there, is, there are some very good projects uh, in the, uh, for example, high temperature drilling uh, or uh, uh, heat pumps, where there are really, I think of a project, for example, where there are eight different countries involved uh, for heat pumps. Uh, so I think that on the industrial research and innovation, I think we are in a very good position and maybe also academic one. Uh, when it turns to policies and uh, uh, let's, let's say standards, that's where we are lacking a bit. Hmm. Insightful perspectives there from Jeremy and Luca. And a good reminder that policies and standards are really areas where we need more and deeper collaboration. Absolutely. And we know that the International Association of Drilling Contractors is working on a broader well classification scheme. But when it comes to international uh, efforts on policies, are there any real efforts yet? Yeah, none that come to mind. Maybe you know more. If you do, please tell us because we'd love to cover that in upcoming episodes. We really would. So please let us know. This episode is coming to an end, but we'll be back soon with new stories from the geothermal world. Until then, stay curious, stay energized and stay hot. <laughs>